Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Vicki Wynn in for Joe Fryer this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, stepping up as Russia's alleged atrocities in Bucha and other parts of Ukraine are brought to light. New economic sanctions against Russia by the U.S. and our European allies. But Ukraine's President Zelensky says it's not enough, calling on the U.N. to send more weapons to counter Russia's firepower. And once again, calling the devastation in Bucha a war crime. Meanwhile, President Biden pledging the U.S. will donate $100 million in anti-tank missiles to the war effort. We have the very latest on the ground from our own Richard Engel this morning. More than a spring break, relief for the nation's millions of students who are working to pay back those student loans. Well, that could soon be extended by the White House. The announcement expected to come today that will pause debt payments for at least the next couple of months. Also this morning, stabilized. With COVID largely in remission here in the U.S., we'll revisit one hospital that was at one time a virus hotspot. How are the conditions now? And are they worried about a new wave? Plus, poise over war. Russia and Ukraine coming together with all the beauty, serenity, and confidence of ballet. Some images there that are just pretty amazing to yeah. see, given what's going on. Absolutely. It's nice to see. Well, we begin this hour with the war in Ukraine. Officials there are urging civilians to leave the eastern part of the country, quote, while it's safe amid fears of a massive Russian offensive in the Donbass region. Yeah, this is after President Zelensky's address at the U.N. Security Council just yesterday. Zelensky gave a disturbing account of alleged Russian atrocities in Kiev suburbs. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel visited some of those areas, spoke with people caught up in the violence, and a warning the images in this report might be distressing to some viewers. There's a large gap in the center of Borodyanka outside Kiev, where an apartment building once stood. Residents say hundreds of civilians were hiding in shelters under these buildings. Shelters that became tombs still unreachable under the debris. It's unclear how many were killed. Deliberately targeting civilians is a war crime, unless Russia can somehow prove that this was a military target. Borodyanka is just 15 miles from Bucha, where mass graves were discovered after Russian troops were driven out. Addressing the UN Security Council Tuesday, President Zelensky wondered if there's a point to having a Security Council if it can't provide security. Russia denies that its troops murdered civilians in Bucha, a Kiev suburb, claiming Ukrainians staged the aftermath with actors. The Russian propaganda doesn't hold up to witness and survivor accounts. In front of their building in Bucha, Valentina and her friend said Russian soldiers went apartment to apartment, mostly looking for men. They were breaking open doors with axes and sledgehammers, she says. If you talked back, they shot you. She wanted to show me something behind the building. She's saying one of her neighbors was so frightened because the Russian soldiers were banging on his door that he jumped out of that window on the third floor and came landing on the ground. He didn't die hurt himself, but managed to escape. He thought the Russians were just going to shoot him dead. Desperation. A few feet away was a grave Valentina dug with her friend. You put up a cross. Four people here? Two were our neighbors, she says. We don't know who the other two are, but buried them anyway. She says all four of them were machine gunned by Russian troops. She doesn't know why. Please don't let this happen again, she says. We are regular, hardworking people. Down the street, the Abramov family was in their home when they say Russian soldiers threw a grenade through the window and set the house on fire. Vladimir and his daughter Irina came running out in the cold in slippers. They started to ask, where are the Nazis, he says. They said, we are Russians, we came to liberate you. The soldiers grabbed Irina's husband Oleg and shot him in the head. I started to shout, kill me too, because I have only one husband. Ukrainian officials say hundreds of civilians were killed in Bucha, and the toll is rising, as Russia appears to have used scorched earth tactics in its failed attempt to capture Kyiv. Thanks to Richard Engel for that report that was, of course, tough to listen to and see. Let's bring in Angela Sent now for more. Angela is a senior advisor to the Center for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies at Georgetown University and is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Angela, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So, I mean, let's just pick up with the atrocities that we just heard about there in that report from Richard Engel. The same thing that President Zelensky referenced yesterday when accusing Russia of war crimes during his speech to the U.N. Security Council. 
and ask the organization to do more to punish Russia. Do you think the new sanctions from the U.S. and Europe go far enough, first of all, just in terms of what we just heard described, but also enough to hold Russia accountable here? I mean, sanctions thus far have obviously not slowed anything down. Well, the sanctions, you know, will have a major economic impact on Russia. They're already having it. The Russians won't be able to service their debt anymore in dollars. So it has an economic impact that punishes people. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to make any difference uh, in terms of Russia's war aims and what it's doing on the on the battlefield there. Uh, even, you know, they're now saying they may sanction uh, Putin's two older daughters. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but nothing, I think, at the moment is going to deter Putin from what he's determined to do, which is to subjugate Ukraine. How do these suspected war crimes and what President Zelensky is seeing happen in his country and, and walking these neighborhoods, uh, how do these jeopardize the ongoing peace talks between Russia and Ukraine? I mean, could there really be a serious step forward in negotiations as long as Russia continues its attacks like this on civilians? Well, I'm afraid to say that so far the Ukrainians have been serious in these negotiations, mm. but the Russians haven't. Uh, the can, can, the Ukrainians have put forward a number of concessions, major concessions they're willing to make. And the Russian negotiators who sit down with them saying, yes, we're making progress. And then immediately the Kremlin says, no, no progress has been made. So I do not believe at this point that the Russians are serious about negotiating even a ceasefire uh, and certainly not an end to these hostilities. Angela, just yesterday, the U.S. military's top general said the conflict in Ukraine could take years to be resolved. What do you think about that statement? What do you think that could look like? Is this fighting in the East, as we saw prior to this invasion? And what would the lasting impact of a drawn-out war be? What would ultimately lead to end Russia's invasion? Well, unfortunately, I agree with the generals that I think this will be a long, long drawn out conflict. Don't forget that the Russians have been fighting the Ukrainians since 2014, since the war in the Donbass began, and 14,000 people died just in that conflict so far. So we could see a lot in the fighting. We could maybe see temporary ceasefires. The Russians right now are focusing on securing the Donbass, that region in southeastern Ukraine. But unfortunately, I don't think they're done yet. Um, mm. And they, you know, they will, this could continue to grind on for a very long time. And that will clearly have a very serious impact also on Ukraine's neighbors as well, of course, as on Ukraine. And Angela, you mentioned that the Ukrainians have been serious in coming to the table in these peace talks. We know one of the potential ideas now that could maybe be a step towards ending this is that contested region in the east if Russia just focuses its attacks and attention on trying to essentially gain that region. But President Zelensky has, you know, very clearly said our borders are our borders. What do you think this could come down to in terms of that region and not being a negotiation piece here. Well, he said that President Zelensky said, let's sit down and talk about this. He said, of course, these are our borders. But you, there's some flexibility there. I think he's willing to see what the, he might be able to agree with the Russians about. But in order to do that, the Russians need to withdraw their troops. That's one of the Ukrainian yeah. conditions. And at the moment, the Russians are refusing to mm. do that. Absolutely. Angela Stunt, thank you so much. We very much appreciate your expertise and analysis this morning. We turn now to the south, where at least two people are dead following a night of severe weather. Tornadoes and thunderstorms whipped across the Gulf and Atlantic coast, bringing hail and strong winds with them. And it is not over yet. Another 29 million people from Florida to Kentucky are under severe weather alerts again today. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Allendale, South Carolina, with the very latest. Morgan, good morning. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. And I got to tell you, it is stunning to see some of this damage here when the, when the daylight has come out. Uh, and this has been a relentless storm system that's now brought damage from Texas here to South Carolina. This is some of what's left of Allendale. And this is one of the communities where officials issued that incredibly rare tornado emergency just minutes before this suspected twister struck, uh, leaving at least three people injured in this area uh, and a trail of damage that is incredible. Uh, dozens of buildings here uh, devastated by the this powerful storm and perhaps most frustrating of all uh, is that the danger from severe weather isn't over yet.
Yo, what you're seeing is a tornado out. This morning, down. more severe weather is headed to the storm-ravaged south. More than three dozen tornadoes reported across six states since Monday. Tornado behind R&R, ladies and gentlemen. The latest, this massive twister in Allendale, South Carolina, carving a 15-mile path of destruction Tuesday night. That means very dangerous. You have to take cover now. That warning, even forcing lawmakers to shelter in the basement of the South Carolina State House. Violent storms killed a woman in Bryant County, Georgia. In Newton, Mississippi, this suspected tornado captured on surveillance video as blinding rain and winds moved in in seconds. The aftermath seen nearby with branches littered across highways. In Alabama, more possible twisters shearing trees, flipping cars, and tossing trailers. It was all still in just one minute, and then the next few seconds sounded like a train was outside. The deadly storms first moved through Texas late Monday night, killing one man when a tree fell on his home near Tyler. In Johnson County, one woman was rushing to escape when the storm lifted up her entire house. Before I knew it, it blew my glass doors in, and then the house just started tumbling. Brittany Deaton is hurt but alive this morning thanks to her dad. He ran to the rescue after she became trapped inside the family's RV. But just as they ran for cover, powerful winds rolled the trailer right on top of them. I got hit by something and fell over and it scratched me all up. And my dad got hit by the trailer. He's now recovering in a hospital. His family calling him a hero. Because he saved her in my thoughts. He saved my daughter. This dangerous system that drenched multiple states is now causing major flooding and bringing with it golf ball sized hail. And today, the rain, wind and tornado risk happening all over again as another round of dangerous spring storms get ready to strike the south. And National Weather Service officials are expected to visit this area today to survey the scope of the damage the suspected tornado left behind. They haven't rated uh, or categorized this tornado yet, but they did say that on radar, debris from this very community was seen pulled up into the atmosphere as high as 20,000 feet in the wow. air as the storm system tore through. Wow, Vicky. incredibly powerful storms. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. And as Morgan just mentioned, these storms are expected to keep pummeling the southeast. Let's get a check on that with your morning news now weather and see what's in store for today. For that, we turn to meteorologist Bill Karens. And last hour, Bill, you told us usually you get a day after the calm mm -hmm. after the storm, but that's not the case now. Yeah, there's a good chance Morgan and his crew will just relocate somewhere yeah. nearby because that, they're in the area of a risk for severe storms again today. So let me just take you through the severe threat, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to happen this upcoming weekend. So 29 million people at risk today. Anywhere in the yellow, that's a slight risk. The orange is what we call an enhanced risk. Later today, it is a possibility we could see a moderate risk issued somewhere inside of that uh, orange area. So that just tells you you have a better chance of getting severe weather. The probability of it is more widespread if they're in that orange than you are in the yellow. But anyone on that map has a chance of seeing some you know, damaging winds, large hail, and of course, some tornadoes are possible again today. The threat is minimized a little bit by the time we get to Thursday. Slight risk from Norfolk, Virginia Beach down to Wilmington and also the I-4 corridor. Uh, wind damage should be the biggest threat. The tornado threat should be getting lower on Thursday. So now let's talk about what's next after we finally get rid of this. We're going to call this fire and ice because we're still going to see some pretty extreme weather into the weekend. We're not going to have tornadoes or anything like that. But the temperatures in the west are going to be incredibly warm. We're going to see record highs possible Thursday and Friday for everywhere that you see a little red dot there, every city on that map. And that includes Los Angeles. I mean, Los Angeles has a chance to be in the upper 90s on Thursday and Friday. I mean, that's insane. Uh, San Diego should be in the low 90s. I mean, it's one thing for Phoenix to do it, but for L.A. to Bakersfield, that's pretty rare for this time of year. L.A. will be about 25 degrees warmer than they should be from the, what their average high temperature is this time of year. And then the opposite of this is going to be in the plains, where it's going to be colder and windy, and critical fire weather is expected as we head into the weekend, especially areas of Colorado and Oklahoma. If any fires form, they would spread rapidly with wind gusts up to 50 miles per hour and low humidity. And then the cold side of this is going to be in the northern plains, where it's snowing this morning. Temperatures remain very chilly and unAprilike. like uh, more like March from Chicago to Minneapolis. So a little bit of everything and uh, more extreme weather into the weekend, but not, not tornadoes. You know, tornadoes are kind of up there in their own category of just fear and yeah, destruction. Absolutely. Oh, same with those wildfires, though, the potential for that. All right, Bill, thank you so much. Appreciate yes. it, Bill.
Well, millions of people with student loans could soon be getting another break. Today, the Biden administration is expected to announce another freeze on federal student loan payments. This would extend the moratorium that's been in effect since the beginning of the pandemic. NBC News chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now with more on what we can expect. Kristen, good morning. These loan payments were supposed to resume on May 1st, less than a month from now. But now we're talking about a pause going on until possibly August 31st. This comes pretty much with good timing, right? We're seeing the highest inflation in 40 years. Yeah. Talk about the factors that went into this uh, plan. And do you think possibly this is going to lead to some loan forgiveness altogether? <laughs> Well, it could. And look, Vicki, for context, the White House said the extension through January would be the last one. But then uh, effectively, because of those pressures that you just talked about, Omicron hit, they extended the pause on payments through May. Now, this next extension that we're talking about right now comes amid yet another variant and against the backdrop of soaring inflation and supply chain issues. Democrats and consumer advocates have really been turning up the heat, trying to pressure the president to extend the halt on payments because of all of those issues that you and I just talked about, Vicki. And in fact, dozens of Democratic lawmakers sent a letter to the president last week encouraging him to take this step. So again, this latest pause, it's likely to last through August. It would be the sixth extension of this pause. It started under former President Trump. And don't forget, there are some real political pressures at play here as well. Democrats are bracing for the possibility of big losses in the midterm. So if the loan payments resume right before the midterms, mm -hmm. that could spell even more trouble for the president's party. So expect this conversation and the pressure to ramp up all over again when we get to August, Vicki. Well, Kristen, when President Biden ran for office, and you know this, he campaigned in part off of canceling $10,000 in yeah. student loan debt. Congressional Democrats have called on the president to do even more, including through his own executive action, his own powers. Where do things stand there? So far, the president and the White House do not think that the best course of action is to take executive action on student loans. The president wants Congress to pass legislation so that it won't be challenged legally. Congress, as you rightfully say, Vicky, wants the president to do this unilaterally. Now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Senator Elizabeth Warren have been pushing the president to go even further, to cancel closer to $50,000 in student loans per student, per borrower. Now, as for legislation getting passed, right now. It's a really steep hurdle with the midterms looming. Very tough to get any legislation through the sharply divided Congress. Thank yeah, you. we're on a pause there, too. Kristen Welker, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thanks. Let's stay on your money. And as the cost of groceries and other goods continue to rise, buyers are concerned about whether this record inflation will lead to a potential recession. So many are buying more generic brands to help make me to help make ends meet. There we go. NBC News business and technology correspondent Jill and Kent joins us now with more on these concerns. Hey, Joe, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. After a rapid economic recovery from the height of the pandemic, there are now new worries and warnings of a possible recession triggered by those high prices for food and gas. This comes as NBC News polling shows the majority of Americans disapprove of how President Biden is handling the economy. This morning, shoppers are pinching pennies as inflation continues to soar and fears of a recession are on the rise. According to new data, consumers are buying more generic store brands for the first time in almost two years, choosing cheaper versions of cooking oil, eggs, sugar, toilet paper, and baby formula. And shoppers are purchasing smaller amounts of products like cereal and cleaning supplies as inflation remains at a 40-year high. Families are making cuts to afford those rising grocery and gas bills. We never eat out anymore. That's the other. We used to eat out like once a week or something, and we hardly ever do that anymore. At Jim Dandy's, a restaurant in Rutherford, New Jersey, owner Brian Flynn is feeling the pain. So the way the food costs are running out of control, and, you know, uh, the labor shortage, it's really unprecedented. He says he's hiked prices four times due to the rising cost of labor, frying oil and chicken, but still loses money on every plate of chicken fingers. I should charge $21 for five chicken fingers and fries. I don't. I charge $13.95. With inflation sky high, Goldman Sachs now puts the odds of a recession at 38% in the next two years. 
Last week, changes in the bond market signaled a possible economic slowdown. Recessions usually trigger widespread job cuts and unemployment, but Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell says he's trying to prevent that by raising interest rates gradually this year. For the consumers out there who are worried about their jobs in a possible recession, what do you say to that? Well, I, you know, I, I say that our intention is to bring inflation back down to 2% while still sustaining a strong labor market and that the economy is very strong. Now, by raising interest rates slowly, the, Fed's, the Fed hopes to cool off consumer spending without triggering the recession, uh, a recession of layoffs and unemployment, right? But if you're worried, experts recommend boosting your emergency savings, watching your budget, making those tough calls to deal mm -hmm. with these persistent high prices. Savannah? Oof, yeah, it's tough all around. All right, Joe, thank you so much. Coming up on Morning News Now, kidnapped overseas. We'll tell you about the search now underway for an American nun gone missing in West Africa. That's next. Welcome back. There are new developments this morning in the investigation into that deadly mass shooting in San Sacramento this past weekend. Police say a second suspect is now under arrest. 27-year-old Smiley Martin is facing several charges, including possession of a firearm and possession of a machine gun. Martin is the brother of the first suspect police arrested, DeAndre Martin. Both men have a long list of previous convictions from domestic violence charges to a string of robberies. They're expected to make their next court appearance later this month. At least six people were killed in the early Sunday morning shooting. Police are continuing to investigate what led to the attack. This morning, there are many unanswered questions regarding a missing American nun in West Africa. Yes, yeah, Sister Solon Tennyson of New Orleans was kidnapped Monday by gunmen. Few details are known about what happened, but the State Department says it's investigating. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with the latest on this investigation. Hey, Aaron, good morning. Good morning. On Monday night, colleagues say Sister Sue Ellen Tennyson was kidnapped in Burkina Faso, a West African country struggling with poverty and violence. With few clues as to where she was taken or why she was kidnapped, this morning around the world, they're praying for Sister Sue Ellen's safe return. Friends of Sister Sue Ellen Tennyson say they weren't surprised when the 83-year-old nun announced her calling to help the people of Burkina Faso, one of the poorest countries in the world, now facing a desperate humanitarian situation, in part due to a prolonged drought. A kinder, gentler soul does not exist. She went over there because it was such an impoverished village, and she thought she could help. Well known throughout New Orleans for helping the city overcome any number of crises, including Hurricane Katrina, Sister Sue Ellen was drawn to do the same in Burkina Faso, despite the West African country's deteriorating security situation. On Monday night, two nuns who survived the attack called Sister Anne Lacour in Paris to tell her Sister Sue Ellen had been kidnapped. There was a lot of fear in their voices. They knew that the kidnappers had guns. They went from the kitchen to each one of the bedrooms where the sisters are. But the only one that was kidnapped was Sister Sue Ellen. We suspect they were looking for money and medicine. And what is the State Department doing to find her? The answer was we are doing everything we can to find Sister Sue Ellen. She makes you feel like everything's going to be okay no matter what is happening around you. I have no doubt that she has already forgiven her captors. NBC reached out to the State Department about Sister Sue Ellen's apparent kidnapping. A spokesperson tells NBC News that they're aware of the reports of a U.S. citizen missing in Burkina Faso and that the embassy is working diligently to verify the reports and is monitoring the situation. Sister, Sister Anne was telling me just how important Sister Sue Ellen's work in Burkina mm. Faso is. People walk 50 miles for treatment at the wow. clinic where she works. Because of the heat, they've seen a surge in cases of malaria, especially among children, which is part of the reason why Sister Sue Ellen was so adamant on staying. Guys, oh, we are really hoping for her safe return. Erin, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's now take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now from Beijing. Good morning, Janice. Hey, good morning, guys. Three members of the Security Alliance, known as AUKUS, are planning to work together to develop hypersonic missiles. The U.S. is part of this, along with the U.K. and Australia. And it comes amid growing concern about China's military assertiveness in the Pacific. 
Now, hypersonic missiles are seen as being too fast for any current missile defense systems. Uh, China is believed to have already tested one. Russia already using them, apparently in Ukraine. The Pentagon is looking to budget $4.7 billion next year for the development of hypersonic weapons. A big snowstorm in Bolivia caused mayhem on a major highway, leaving several cars stranded. Some cars were skidding, others were sliding backwards. People were using their license plate to try to shovel the road. Uh, the issue facing people there now, more extreme weather is in the forecast with warnings for heavy rain and even electrical storms. And with robots that can work on assembly lines, wait on tables and even take your temperature, why stop there? Researchers in Japan are working to develop a robot that can accomplish the very crucial task of peeling a banana. <laughs> it skillfully uses two hands, gets the job done in about three minutes, doesn't three minutes. smoosh the fruit inside. There, <laughs> three minutes. The action was repeated hundreds of times in order to collect the right data. And they're saying the goal, the humans are saying that the goal is to have these robots work in food processing factories mm -hmm. to help ease Japan's labor shortage. Well, but least, three minutes, yeah. I might be trying to work on refining that. that yeah, at task least that's time. something humans can do better than robots yeah, at this at point. This point yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that um, video was kind of like hypnotizing. Exactly. I could have watched it like try for the peel for a long time. <laughs> Janice, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Janice. Well, coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, a follow-up appointment with a hospital that was at one point a COVID hotspot. The current conditions with the virus largely in remission here in the States. Welcome back. COVID hospitalization rates are continuing to drop across the country as the U.S. loosens many COVID protocols put into place over two years ago. But experts are concerned the damage has been done. Many fear COVID has permanently altered the healthcare profession from burnout to PTSD. Doctors and nurses are struggling to continue their work in hospitals. And this all comes, of course, as new COVID variants quickly become dominant strains, raising concerns about a new wave in the near future. We want to check back in with Dr. Richina Bissett. She's the medical director of the McNair Campus Emergency Department, somebody that you probably recognize because she's joined us a number of times over the course of the pandemic and is a friend of the show. Doctor, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So, I mean, first off, it's been more than two years since COVID was first reported in the U.S. During that time, throughout these two years, we've talked to you about the strain your hospital has been under. At the time, like many hospitals across the country, the fatigue, the burnout your staff was feeling what do things look like right now? I mean, are you even close to back to normal at your hospital or seeing different challenges come up now that we're kind of past the peak? Absolutely not, Savannah. It's actually interesting to see. COVID numbers are way down. We're seeing the lowest hospitalization rate since the Department of Health and Human Services began tracking hospitalizations in 2020. Yet still across the country, hospitals remain 80% full. So although COVID numbers are going down, people are still coming in ill with other sicknesses, strokes, heart attacks, mm -hmm. accidents, gun violence is at an all-time high. It's like we've been running at a full sprint for two years and there are no other staff members to tag in for us to get a break. So doctor, looking ahead as these COVID variants circulate and people do still come down with COVID like Omicron, now this XE variant, tell us what you're seeing with those patients. Is that increasing and are they any more difficult to treat? Or, you know, we think back to the beginning and we were talking so much about respirators and, and there not being enough beds. What is all that like now in your treatment? Well, personally, I find that in my emergency department, I am getting more patients who are incidentally found to have COVID mm. as opposed to people who are coming in with COVID symptoms and mm. then positive. We are seeing right now about 25 to 28,000 cases per day in the United States, which is extremely low in the lowest case numbers we've seen since last summer. However, treatment is becoming an issue as new variants begin to emerge. Monoclonal antibodies are no longer a staple of outpatient treatment, as it seems as if they are not working against this new variant. There also have been some oral antiviral medicines like Paxlovid that have been approved for use, but we're not seeing that employed too often because there are a lot of medication interactions and it's only approved for older adults who are at risk for severe disease. Mm. 
No, we've reported extensively, and I just mentioned the burnout. Doctors and nurses are failing because of the pandemic. So first, I'm wondering, how are you doing? How's your staff doing at this point? And what you see for the future of the medical field? It's really hard to say, Savannah. I do know that for a lot of physicians, there have been some people that have abandoned bedside clinical medicine to pursue other avenues and other endeavors because at one point it just became too much. Even when we see COVID numbers start to decrease, we've been here before. And although the saying is what goes up must come down, we've seen with COVID cases that what goes down can actually quickly spike back up as well. So we're constantly on a state of alert. And that's a very stressful situation to be in mentally, physically, and emotionally. I mentioned at the top of this, doctor, that in some ways people are concerned that the medical field has changed permanently. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. We will never be the same. Mm, absolutely. Dr. Richina Bissett, thank you for joining us. It's so great to have you with us. And thanks for sharing the experience you and your staff are going through. Thank you, Savannah. Have a great day. Coming up, the latest installment in our network-wide series, The Fleecing of America, and this one's a doozy. Aren't they always the nation's <laughs> taxpayers taken for billions during the pandemic? Fraud on a massive scale, all tracing back to one government program, unemployment. That story right after this break. We are back with our series that you just saw there, The Fleecing of America, and what may be the biggest fleece ever. Yeah, taxpayers were taken for billions of dollars as the government rushed to support Americans who lost their jobs during the pandemic, and that left the door wide open for a lot of fraud. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has been investigating this for us, and he joins us here on set. Hey, Tom, good morning. This is going to make you angry. Are you ready? Your yeah. blood will boil on this one. Oof. Here's the bottom line. This is a program that, as you know, was meant to uh, really help all of us, right? But but this unemployment insurance fraud has exploded. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars. Your money, my money, it's gone. The chances of getting it back, not so good. In Pennsylvania, a horrific case of identity theft caught on camera in a restroom. Will you please confirm your social security number? Prosecutors say a caretaker for intellectually disabled people stole their identities and filed more than $100,000 in fake unemployment assistance claims. He has not entered a plea. In California, a hospital worker allegedly stole the identities of dying patients for a fraud ring. This guy died a few hours ago. How many names do we need, he texted a co-conspirator. And it's happening in every city and state. Crooks stealing billions in pandemic-related state unemployment benefits. Claims being made in the names of inmates, death row people, dead people, fake people. Sacramento District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert. Is this a fleecing of America? It's the biggest fleecing of America that I think we'll ever see. And Sacramento is in the middle of it. Unemployment insurance fraud is happening across the country. But California is ground zero, with an estimated 20 to $30 billion in fraud in just two years. That's equal to almost 10% of what California state agencies spent last year stolen. Who's behind it? Everyday Americans and criminals, even overseas crime syndicates, cashing in on pandemic unemployment assistance. Many filing obviously fake claims using aliases like Minnie Mouse, Poopy Britches, and John Doe. But the states, ill-equipped to audit the millions of pandemic claims, were also under pressure to issue the checks to prevent mass unemployment and poverty. Tens of thousands of California prison inmates' names were used to file claims and send those checks to addresses nationwide. Any one of these houses could be a drop spot. And you'd never know. You'd never know. John Casa's software is used to uncover this kind of fraud. He says the total losses are much higher than most states are willing to admit. I can tell you that in some states, we saw as many as three out of four applications for some of the federal programs were very likely fraudulent. 75%? 75% in certain states. Really astounding numbers. Many claims are filed under stolen identities, yours and mine, for sale on the dark web. Security veteran Derek Benner took us inside. This person is selling 8,000 passports, seven bucks each. And they contain personal information such as social security numbers and dates of birth. 
Some criminals filed thousands of bogus claims simultaneously, the web spreading across the country. The problem? Most states don't share insurance claim or fraud information with each other. NBC News asked all 50 states how much they'd lost to fraud and how many Americans have been affected. Most didn't know or wouldn't say. But Ohio State Auditor Keith Faber was candid. His own stolen identity was used in a fraud scheme. We found systemic failures at all levels. Uh, we found uh, that, that the system did not have the proper controls to avoid uh, fraud and overpayments. We think the total number now is over $5 billion in loss. We're going to have to fix this problem. Unless America is willing to accept that, we're going to literally send hundreds of billions of dollars to criminals. And police say street criminals have found easy money in filing fake claims, helping to fuel the surge in drugs, guns, and violence. A lot of people may think that, you know, unemployment insurance fraud is kind of a victimless crime. You're just taking money from the government. Well, ask, ask anybody on the other side of a handgun, particularly, or an automatic weapon or an AR-15 that's been purchased with unemployment insurance fraud. Ask them that that's a victimless crime. Ask anybody who's child was found dead in the room because of fentanyl poisoning. When we put astronomical amounts of money into the hands of criminal, this is not a victimless crime. Yeah, I want you to listen to this stat. First of all, California says it is taking steps to come down on this already blocking $125 billion in fraud. But listen to this. Experts believe the scale of the unemployment related fraud nationwide surpassing $200 billion. That's the amount of money that Google's parent company made worldwide oh last year. It's your money. It's my money. It's your money. It's gone. Is there any hope of getting it back? Not much. The problem is a lot of this is overseas crime syndicates, literally Nigeria and Eastern Europe, getting that money back very, very challenging. And for the people who lose their identities, it can be such a nightmare to try to reclaim who you are and get the rightful yep. benefits if you're on that side of it. And I listen, I've done so many stories over the last 10 years going into the dark web. You should assume that your information is, in fact, on the dark web right oh, now. Wow. Always be okay, monitoring, you know, your credit report. What I don't know you about do? you. I freeze, I freeze my credit. Yeah. So you, nobody can open up some loan to buy a new car without me knowing it. I freeze it. When I need my credit, I unfreeze it for three days, freeze it again. Good wow, advice. Great yeah. advice. Especially you hearing selling passports for seven bucks. I mean, it's wow, yep. some startling details. I know. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Great to have you here on set with us. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks. See you, Tom. Yeah. Now let's stay on your money with our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now. Hey, good morning, Silvana. Good morning. JetBlue is offering to buy Spirit Airlines for $3.6 billion. The bid could break up a plan for Spirit to merge with rival budget carrier Frontier. JetBlue says combining with Spirit would lead to lower fares by creating a challenger to the nation's four biggest airlines, American, Delta, United, and Southwest. That's the same argument Frontier made when it unveiled its takeover offer back in February. And combined, JetBlue and Spirit would have about 170 daily flights to Florida alone. Volkswagen plans to focus on its profitable premium vehicles and scrap many gas-powered models by the end of the decade. That's according to the Financial Times. VW's brands inclu also include Audi and Porsche. The new strategy is a sign of major changes in the auto industry, which has attempted for decades to increase profit by selling more cars each year, even if that means resorting to heavy discounts. And Google Maps is rolling out some new updates including an estimate on how much you may have to pay for tolls on your trip. Google says it looks at factors such as the cost of using EasyPass or other payment methods the day of the week and the cost of the toll at the specific time you'll be crossing it. Toll-free routes will also be displayed. The feature will be available on Android and iOS devices for more than 2,000 toll roads in the U.S., India, Indonesia, and Japan later this month, with more countries mm. coming soon. Can I say I love That's that cool. feature yeah. so much? Yes. It's so helpful. Same. And it, it, right now, with gas prices and inflation, oh, it makes a huge yeah. difference. And a lot of times, when, if I'm on the road in a rental car working on a story or something, yeah. and you don't know the area, and all no. of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm on a toll road. Right. Okay. Yeah, didn't exactly. Know exactly. All right, Silvana, yeah. thanks so much. You got it. Coming up on Morning News Now, fighting back against Moscow's aggression with the subtle and confident energy of ballet. The Ukrainian and Russian dancers helping the war effort the only way they know how. Plus, the brother-sister TikTok duo bringing autism awareness to a brand new audience. You'll want to see this one. It's up next.
welcome back. As the war in Ukraine rages on, Russian and Ukrainian ballet dancers are leaving their home countries, now united against the violence as well as their shared love of dance. Now you think about the cosmonauts and the astronauts, mm. and now you have Russian and Ukrainian ballerinas yeah. sharing the stage. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga brings us their story. <laughs> Well, ballet is a much-loved uh, tradition, even an institution in both Russia and Ukraine that goes back centuries. So you could say that by dancing together on that stage at the Opera House in Naples, those dancers from both countries really moved some steps toward reconciliation. Divided by bullets, united by ballet. These Russian and Ukrainian dancers left their countries for different reasons. The Ukrainians to flee the war, the Russians because they were against it. They are now united on a neutral stage, the Opera House in Naples for a fundraising gala. Among them is Olga Smirnova, until recently the lead dancer at Russia's Bolshoi, one of the most prestigious opera houses in the world. Two weeks after the war started, Smirnova wrote on Telegram, I condemn the war with all the fibers of my soul. She called it a global catastrophe and said she never thought she would be ashamed of Russia. She then left the Bolshoi, Russia, and her family behind. I just want to, to see them. Yeah. I don't have any plan to, to come back to Russia. Smirnova is not the first ballet dancer to leave Russia for political reasons. In 1961, Rudolf Nureyev, considered by some the greatest ballet dancer ever, famously defected to the West. My country is stage, my nationality is a dancer. But while Olga and Nureyev decided to leave their country, Ukrainian ballet dancers fled due to the Russian invasion. Anastasia Gurskaya is the leading dancer at the National Opera of Ukraine. After the start of the war, she hid in a bomb shelter for two weeks before she left the country. I thought that I, I should to do something for supporting my country. If I will just um, sit in uh, the shelter, I can't uh, support and help in my country. But now I, I had this chance to, to be here and tell my opinion on the stage for my dance. Tens of Ukrainian ballet dancers have found shelter in opera houses across Europe, but not all of them fled the war. Oleksiy Potyomkin is the principal dancer at the National Opera of Ukraine. After his country became a theater of war, he swapped ballet costumes with bulletproof camouflage. In a statement sent to NBC News, he says he has no military training, but decided to join the army and now helps paramedics evacuate wounded soldiers and help civilians. In the meantime, he keeps practicing. Not easy, in army uniform and a rifle in his hand. His dream, to dance again in front of an audience in times of peace. This is what his fellow dancers were here for. The only real steps, for now, toward reconciliation. Well, the gala raised $50,000 in ticket sales. They will all be donated to the Italian Red Cross and will be used to pay for clothes, food and housing for the tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees who've already arrived in Italy. All right, Claudio, thank you so much for bringing us that story. Yeah, amazing. And now this week marks the beginning of Autism Awareness Month. And this morning, we want to bring you the story of a brother and sister duo from Richmond, Virginia. Brittany and Ryan McGuire get millions of people to watch their TikTok videos. They give a rare glimpse into life with autism. Their joy and laughter puts a <laughs> smile on almost anybody who watches them while they teach compassion along the way. And they joined the Today Show earlier to talk more about their viral videos. Take a listen. When they very first say me, it's like, whoa, you're that right guy from TikTok. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whoa, you're, aren't you that right guy from TikTok? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's like, it blows my mind. What do you, do you like it? I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. What do you mm -hmm. say? What do you say back? I go, yes, I am. <laughs> sure I am. It seems like you're comfortable being in public and you talk about anxiety. Has 
Has uh, TikTok changed the way you feel? Oh, uh huh. It, yeah. it really has, and it really has eased my anxiety level. Yeah, like the social aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stepping out of your comfort zone. A yeah, little it's bit. like I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and into the fire. TikTok brought us together because it gave us a way to bond and to find something that we both enjoy, like having in common and everything. Because he's a big sports guy and he knows a lot more than I do. It, it, it helped us bond more. Absolutely. Yeah. It more. helped me get a better understanding. Ryan, what do you think people learn about autism yeah. when they see these mm -hmm. videos? Well, what they learn is they learn what autism is and they learn what autism how you want to be treated. How I want to be treated. Absolutely. How autism want, needs to be treated. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which is so important. Now, Ryan was in for quite a treat while he <laughs> was at the Today Show. His favorite basketball team is the New York Knicks. So who better to give Ryan a special message than none other than Knicks guard Derek Rose. Rose recorded a greeting for Ryan before giving him tickets to tonight's game along with a signed jersey. How cool is that? I and mean, so important. I love that they are bringing, mm -hmm. so many of us know someone who has autism or mm -hmm. a family. We're all touched by it, so they're bringing a different perspective for us. Absolutely, and we hear how much of a difference it's made for him yeah. having TikTok. Mm -hmm. And having so much fun with it, yeah. too. Well, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.